The second law of thermodynamics comes in a lot of different forms, and there are a lot of ways to think about it. For me, the best place to start is with a simple, everyday observation that heat does not flow spontaneously from objects at a low temperature to objects at a higher temperature. The Clausius statement of the second law of thermo is just a careful, precise way of saying that. And it's a law of nature. It's not something that we can prove. It's something that seems to be true in every experiment that's ever been done. If there is ever a good experiment that finds something different, then this law will be overturned. So it's a simple enough statement on the face of it, but it has some very profound consequences. And to put it in context, uh, go back to 1712, when Newcomen made some of the first steam engines and they were used to pump water out of mines. By 1780, James Watt has done most of his work, uh, has improved steam engines a lot, and they are everywhere in factories driving the Industrial Revolution. By 1810, steam engines are appearing in trains and ships for the first time, and that will be another revolution. In 1824 then, Sadiq Carnot, uh, a very young man, a uh, French military engineer, publishes his book called Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. And the title of the book tells you something about the state of knowledge at the time. People understood that there was some connection between fire and the ability to create work, to create motion, because that's what steam engines did. But it wasn't really understood how that how that worked in a general way. So Watt and other contemporaries were geniuses when it came to the mechanical design of steam engines. But Carnot wasn't interested in the detail. He was looking for fundamental connections that would be true for all kinds of engine. So his genius was to abstract away all the detail. And his model for an engine is as valid for a modern diesel engine or jet engine as it was for a watt steam engine. Kerner realized that any conceivable engine could be represented by this kind of a model. It receives heat from a high temperature reservoir, a heat source at a temperature TH. It does an amount of work, W, that is it transfers energy mechanically to some outside load and it rejects some heat QL to a low temperature reservoir at TL and we call this a heat engine and we're only going to think about cyclic engines that is engines that keep cycling through the same state like the cylinder of a diesel engine for example or the cylinder of a steam engine uh, because of that it means that our engine doesn't accumulate energy over a long time. Kerner realized that any conceivable engine could be represented by this simple model of a heat engine. Any engine is going to receive heat from a, from a heat source, a high temperature reservoir. Uh, it does an amount of work, W, that is it transfers energy mechanically to some outside load. It rejects some heat, QL, to a low temperature reservoir at TL. And we're going to consider only cyclic heat engines, that is engines that keep returning to the same state in a cycle so that over long periods of time they don't accumulate any energy internally or lose energy from some internal store. Uh, and we know the first law of thermodynamics, though Carnot didn't, so we can see that there has to be a conservation of energy in that whole engine, so W is equal to QH minus QL. We can use the same kind of model to represent a heat pump, and the most familiar kind of heat pump is a refrigerator. It receives heat from some low temperature reservoir, which would be the chilled interior of a refrigerator. It receives some work as well, which is the electrical power that we provide to an ordinary refrigerator. And the work and the received heat are combined and rejected as heat to a high temperature source. So let's see what we can learn from this model. Let's take a heat engine. We put it between a high temperature reservoir at TH low temperature reservoir at TL and let's make it a reversible engine. What that means is that we can reverse the direction of all the energy transfers into and out of the engine. So we'll have work W going in, we'll have a heat transfer a QL going in and we'll have a heat transfer QH coming out on the hot side. And now it's not a heat engine anymore, it's a heat pump. So we've reversed the heat engine. We've reversed our reversible heat engine to make a heat pump. Now let's take another heat engine. 
it beside the first one. And let's design it so that it gives us a work output exactly equal to W. And that means we can use it to drive our heat pump. This heat engine will need a heat source. So we'll take some heat from the high temperature reservoir. We'll call that QH prime. And let's suppose now that our new heat engine is more efficient than the first one. So if it's more efficient and it's delivering an amount of heat W, same as the original one did, then it must be taking a smaller supply of heat than the original one. So QH prime is less than QH. It's going to reject some heat and we can use the first law to see if the rejected heat is QH prime minus W, whatever's left over after we take, after we convert some heat into work. We can use the first law on the heat pump as well to write QL in terms of QH and W. So we'll use the good old thermodynamics technique of drawing a box around uh, these two machines, the heat pump and the heat engine, so that we can then uh, ignore everything that's inside the box and just concentrate on what we can see going into and out of the box. So on the hot side, we have QH coming out of the box. We have QH prime coming into the box. QH prime is smaller than QH. So we have a net flow of heat uh, out of this blue machine into the high temperature reservoir. Uh, and the net flow of heat is QH minus QH prime. On the cold side, we have QH coming in to our blue box. We've got QH prime going out. Actually, we've got QH minus W, QH prime minus W. If we combine those, the Ws cancel out, and we've got a net heat transfer of QH minus QH prime. So let's stand back from this and see what our, uh, what our blue box is doing. It is receiving heat from a low temperature reservoir. It's rejecting or transferring exactly the same amount of heat to a high temperature reservoir. In effect, what it's doing is it's, it's moving heat from low temperature to high temperature, and that's impossible. Common sense tells us it's impossible, and the Clausius statement of the second law is a formal scientific version of that common sense observation. So we've ended up here with something that is uh, impossible. So if we've created something that's impossible, we must have done something wrong in our setup. Uh, and the weak link in our setup is the point where we assumed we could make a more efficient engine than the original engine, which was reversible. So from this, we conclude that it's impossible to have an engine that is more efficient than a reversible engine between a given pair of reservoirs. That is called the Carnot principle, the first Carnot principle, or it goes by some other names too. You can do a very similar proof. You can just change that proof a little bit to uh, come up with the second Carnot principle, which says that all reversible engines have the same thermal efficiency. This introduces the idea of reversibility as a very special property of a cycle or a process. And Carnot went further than this. He considered a very specific reversible heat engine, which we now call the Carnot cycle. It uses an ideal gas as the working fluid. It goes through a series of heat transfer and work processes, receiving heat from a high temperature reservoir, rejecting heat to a low temperature reservoir, it's an impossible engine to build, but it's quite an easy engine to analyze. And the analysis is done in every textbook. I'm not going to go through it in detail here. But what Carnot proved from this was that for this particular reversible process, a very simple, very memorable equation holds true. QH over QL equals TH over TL. And since the efficiency is work over QH, we can 
expand that out a bit. We know that work is QH minus QL and so on. So we find that the efficiency of a reversible engine is 1 minus TL over TH with a couple of lines of algebra. That's the efficiency of the Carnot cycle, but every reversible heat engine, every reversible cycle has the same efficiency. So this expression here is the efficiency of any reversible heat engine. So let's put that to work in practice. Let's think about a real engine, for example, a turbofan. Let's suppose the turbofan burns its fuel at 1200 degrees Celsius, that's the temperature in the combustion chamber, and let's say it's flying at altitude in air at minus 20 degrees C. That is the TL for this engine, that's the, uh, the low temperature reservoir for this engine. So we can calculate the efficiency of it. Take care that you use only absolute units of temperature here. If you do it in Celsius and try to convert it back, it, it won't make sense, it won't work. So we plug in the numbers for TL and TH, and we find an efficiency of 0.828, 82.8%. That's the efficiency of a reversible engine operating under the conditions that a turbofan operates at. So in one way, that's a negative result. It tells us that no real engine can have a higher efficiency than 82.8%. No matter how clever we are in the design, no matter what clever aerodynamics we have or what exotic materials we use to make the engine, we will never achieve a higher efficiency than that. But it also contains two positive pieces of information. It tells us how to make the engine efficient. One is that we need to make the engine more reversible, closer to the reversible ideal, so that we can get closer to that 83% limit. The other thing we can do is we can try to raise that limit. By making TH over TL high, we can lift that uh, reversible efficiency or the so-called Carnot efficiency. We can make that bigger if we make TH high. We could make it bigger by making TL low, but in practice, we don't have any control over TL. We have to reject heat to the surroundings that the engine operates in, whatever they are. These two approaches to improving the efficiency of engines, they're exactly what happens in research and development. And you can see it historically. This is a great graph of the history of steam power. And unfortunately, I don't know where I got it, so I can't acknowledge the, the people who made this graph. But um, the fuzzy gray line there is the historical thermal efficiency of steam engines, starting with Newcomen, going through Watt, going right up to 20th century steam power plants up to about 1980. And the dashed line is the efficiency of an isentropic Rankine cycle, which is not quite the Carnot efficiency, but it's something uh, very close to it. And uh, you see two, two things happening there. One is that the, uh, the Rankine cycle efficiency limit is, is coming up over time because engines are running at higher and higher temperatures because their design and the materials used in them enable them to run at higher temperatures. But the other thing that happens at some stages in history is that the gap between the reversible efficiency and the actual thermal efficiency closes. And that's where innovations in uh, the design of engines and turbines are bringing the real engines closer to the reversible limit. So the two main things to take away from this video are the notion of reversibility as a special property of a heat engine and actually it's a special property of a, of any thermodynamic process uh, and the efficiency of a reversible engine which is the highest efficiency that any uh, engine can achieve and it's equal to 1 minus TL over TH or an easier equation to remember is Q, QL over QH equals TL over TH.